Good morning. Happy Saturday, everyone. Allison Scarberg here, Consolidated Planning Group, and I am also here with Adrienne Trevino from the Down Syndrome Association of Houston, and her um, camera is being problematic this morning, so we won't be able to see her, but she is out here. Um, so today we are going to be talking about um, post-high school options for our loved ones with disabilities, and um, there's going to be a lot of information that is shared today. Um, everything that is shared today um, is being recorded, and everyone that has registered for today's um, meeting is also going to get a copy of the slides. If anybody's attending by podcast, they can email us at contact at cpgcares.net and get a copy of today's slides. These slides are going to um, be full of links today that you can click on and kind of do your own research. Um, I always like to mention that at the beginning so you don't have to take notes of everything that we talk about because you will um, actually get a copy of those slides. So in case anybody's wondering, we are in uh, webinar mode today, so we can't see you or hear you, but we do know you're here and we're glad you're here. Um, we're going from 11 to 12 today, so if you're planning your day. And um, Adrian, um, can you tell us, I know that there's another event today with the Down Sy Syndrome Association of Houston. Tell us a little bit about that event for anybody that might be interested. Um, yes, from two to four, we have um, what's called um, arts and crafts with Project Sunshine volunteers. Um, we partner with them. They have a bunch of um, arts and crafts that they send us. And then we um, reserve a room at um, a library near um, our DSH office. And um, it's from ages five to 18. Um, and we just do art, there's all kinds of different arts and crafts that are that they send us. And um, it's just a lot of fun. We have volunteers that come and help, that come and help with um, the kids, so the parents can just you know sit back and watch the little ones. That's or even that's awesome. Have fun, yeah. Will you put the location for that in the chat box in case yes. anybody wants to attend? And Adrian, I would just like to say welcome. We're excited. Um, we're excited to partner with you. Um, Adrian is uh, is new with the uh, Down Syndrome Association um, of Houston, and so. Um, this is our first webinar together with you, and we're happy to have that. So one thing I also wanted to mention today, so while today's uh, webinar is really more focused on some of our older kids, our older teenagers, kids that are transitioning, thinking about higher education options, we have webinars all the time, um, partner with the Down Syndrome Association um, on other topics that might be relevant um, to families that have kids that are younger ages as well. We have a YouTube channel, Consolidated Planning Group YouTube channel. We do special needs webinars um, on most days of the week, um, Monday through Friday. Topics are all surrounding special needs, special needs planning, and things that you might have on your radar. And you can find that on um, that YouTube channel, Consolidated Planning Group. It'll be in the slides as well. And you can subscribe to that for free. There's over 200 webinars out there on topics that might be of interest to you. So you can look at those and um, kind of for the journey and the step that you're on and um, take a look for sure. So Consolidated Planning Group, we're a holistic special needs financial planning firm. We're nationally certified as Social Security Advisor members of the Special Needs Planning Academy. Um, we help people. Um, people come to us and say, you know, we want to plan for our loved one that has a disability. What happens when we're gone? How much do we need to fund a special needs trust? How do we get the benefits um, that are, are due for our loved one? Um, how do we maintain um, eligibility for those benefits? So we help families just like yours with those types of things. Um, I come to you as a parent and a professional uh, uh, mom of four and two with disabilities that have transitioned into adulthood. So baptized by fire here. But and anyway, we love to share this information uh, because our journey is sometimes hard. It's, it's, it's difficult at best sometimes. And um, so, you know, knowledge is power and sharing this information with other families kind of, we, we just hope that it makes your journey a little bit easier along the way. So 
Um, today, what we're doing is we're really talking about educational options um, after high school for special needs families. And we're also going to be, um, you know, talking about alternatives to some of those options as well. Uh, we invite you today to put your questions in the chat box. Adrian's going to be monitoring the chat box, and we aim to answer as many questions as we can within the time that we have today together. Okay. So first things first, when we're, you know, really thinking about, um, you know, next steps for our loved ones, it's really, really important that we start with realistic expectations. Is this a traditional path or a non-traditional path? And one of the things that we say, and we say very, very often, is there's no comparisons. They aren't behind. Our kids aren't behind. They are where they are. And um, and as parents, us meeting where meeting them where they are is really, really important. So um, our kids with disabilities, um, you know, some, some kids are twice exceptional and, and they're, you know, they're going to go through the public high school. They're going to leave the public high school at 18 and they're um, ready and poised to go to on to higher education. Maybe it's a university, um, maybe it's a community college, et cetera. But some of our, our other kids may stay in the public school. They might, our private school post age 18, they might go to an 18 plus program or various transition programs. And I think I, I, I just first want to start out as setting them up for success is, is meeting them where they are and, and, and putting them in a place where they can be most successful. So if that most successful next step is a transition program or an 18 plus program or things like that, those are all things that should be um, considered. So um, we've got our trade schools and our community college there's university degree programs, there's certificate programs that are both at the community college and at universities. Some of the things that we think about is um, considering a reduced college course load, um, maybe living at home at first versus um, on campus. These are all things that can set your child up for success. Some of our kids, you know, uh, an, an average school load is 12 hours for full time. The Social Security Administration says that a full-time course load for an individual with a disability is eight hours, just so you know. So your, your kid does not have to take 12 hours to be considered full-time uh, if they have if they have a disability. But sometimes we've seen where maybe families have um, chose one class um, to get started to see how they do. Most universities and most community colleges have like an introduction to university studies or an introduction to being a great college student. And it's really um, a course on just telling them uh, what they're going to need to do to be successful at a higher education level because it's very, very different than the schooling that they've had so far. So these are good places to start. Um, there are partnerships, which we'll talk about with other organizations to live on campus. Sometimes we think about alternatives to work. Some of our kids from a maturity level, I, I jokingly say that most 18 year olds without disabilities are not college ready, right? If we look at the numbers, we Google that, we'll see that that's actually true. Um, but what are some other options? If your child isn't ready yet at 18 or whatever their age is, there's no magic age they have to go at, at a, a certain point. But what are some other op options out there? Maybe, maybe they're gonna go to work. Um, we have the Texas Workforce Commission vocational rehab. If you're joining us from another state, uh, there is vocational rehab in all states. But Texas Workforce Commission has programs through the vocational rehab program, which is designed to work with your loved one ages 14 to 22. They have programs after age 22 as well. But they are really designed um, to help first identify what are the gaps and impediments to employment that your loved one has, and then how do we close those gaps so they can have substantial gainful activity or work, okay? So these are programs that you may have heard of before. We'll talk more about them, but you might have heard of Summer Earn and Learn, Pre-ETS, like pre-employment pre training services. These are all services that are out there. Um, for our kids with disability. Um, we got to think about the, the career path. What is an ideal work setting for them? Some of them um, have sensory issues. They, they might have social anxieties or other things like that. And, you know, some 
high stress environments like Starbucks, for instance, you see all those people behind the counter going crazy all the time. That might not be a good environment for them. So thinking about some of those things as well. And I always like to mention this. I added this link here for the Department of Labor. If you go to the Department of Labor's um, website, there's a search box right on the main page, and you can click on registered apprenticeships. There are all kinds of registered apprenticeships for our loved ones with disabilities where they're going to be learning a skill, learning on the job and getting paid while they're doing that. Another one that I like to mention is Project Search. This is one that a lot of people maybe haven't heard of before. So if you still have your student and they're actually still in high school, um, Project Search, they have programs all across the U.S. that are designed as kind of like an internship. Um, and a lot of them are with big companies where they're really um, teaching your loved one a skill on the job training. They're getting paid. Um, and, it, and it's kind of like a period of time, but we've had a lot of families that we've worked with that have gone through this project search program and their child got hired full time at good companies like Dow, for instance, some of the local hospitals, good companies, full time jobs with benefits. So I just want to mention that if your kid is already out of high school, the project search really isn't a good fit, but I just wanted to mention that. Um, for anybody that is kind of that still has their kids in the local local school. So we do have a list. Um, we're going to have a list in this webinar, but we have some um, some bigger lists. So if you're interested in some additional post high school options for special needs day and transition programs, um, there are a lot of day and transition programs. So we mentioned the 18 plus programs that is tied to uh, the, the pub public schools, but there are also private pay um, day and transition programs um, all across the state, not just in the greater Houston area that you can look into. And a lot of them are affordable. Some of them are covered by waivers. Um, if you're getting an HCS waiver, some of the other waivers out, out there, some of them may defray some of the costs associated with that. But I think our main thing is, is when we're thinking about our loved one leaving um, the public school or the private school or home school, whatever it is, that whenever that stops, that something else continues. So if it's a trade, if it's a license, if it's a transition program, whatever that looks like, what we're trying to avoid is that they're coming home and they're doing nothing every day, Monday through Friday, they, you know, they're, they're just staying at home. There's, there's just so many things out there. So Let's talk about the six traits students with learning disabilities need to succeed. And this is really true of all people. It's not just people with learning disabilities, but need to succeed when it comes to higher education. Um, Self-awareness. So this is a, this is a, an important thing. Um, really understanding their strengths and weaknesses, both academic and non-academic areas, and being able to communicate some of those things. Um, proactivity, perseverance, goal setting. Um, present and, um, and effective use of social supports and emotional coping strategies. And emotional coping, coping strategies has always been a thing, but ever since COVID, it, I, I don't know, it seems like it's been on steroids um, for a lot of our kids. So really, there's a lot of pressures that come along with higher education, a lot of deadlines and testing and other things that like that. And some of our kids have severe uh, testing anxiety and things like that. Some of our kids just may not um, test well. So knowing, um, you know, having some emotional coping strategies, but knowing where to get support when they're feeling a little overwhelmed, um, both school, school based and family based friend based, that kind of thing is really, really important. Okay. So one thing I really like spending time talking about is the accommodations and offices of disability on, on the college level. So whether we're talking about the community college or we're talking about the university, the one thing that you guys need to know is as you're looking at options in various schools, the offices of disabilities um, they, they could be called ODS, Office of Disability, Disability Services. They have a lot of different names. But in general, it's the office that the school has um, in place to support our loved one with a disability. And they provide accommodations and things like that. So first thing that you need to know is that your IEP and your 504 that you've had all these years does not transfer to the university or the college, okay? So most of these um, schools, they have a website 
on the college campus, you know, uh, website, they have a disability website that'll tell you how you apply for accommodations. So you want to do your homework on the off offices of disability. When I say they're not created equally, some of them are very large and they have a lot of resources. They may, it may have audio books, voice to text recognition software, um, all kinds of different tools that might be helpful um, for your loved one that is, you know, going for higher education. So you want to see what they have available. Some offices of disability are very small and they have limited resources, which means that some of those resources might have to be paid out of pocket by you. Um, so you want to know what the requirements are to get those accommodations and you want to apply for them early. So that way, if a child is starting school, that they're starting out with those accommodations. We don't want to be two or three or four weeks into the semester getting those accommodations because they're already behind. Right. So it's very, very important. The other thing that I would tell you about these, I said that they're not created equally. They all have different sets of rules of what you have to do to apply for these accommodations. They all have an application, but what they require to go along with that application is usually different. Um, they usually want testing. Um, I'm talking about neuropsych testing, learning disability testing, um, or to name a few. Um, that is going to indicate what is the disability, what is the deficit, um, and what accommodations are being, you know, recommended. Okay, so typically they want to see testing that is done has been done in the last three to five years. So if you have an 18 year old that did testing and when they were five or six years old, they're probably not going to take that. However, before you run out and spend $3,500 on testing, I wanted to um, just mention that you know if you've had the same um, pediatrician, the same psychologist or psychiatrist that has followed your child for all these years, your child has a disability that doesn't really change, it's the same. Um, I have found that some colleges and universities will take outdated testing if it is accompanied by a, a current letter from a physician highlighting that the deficits are still the same and these are the accommodations that we're recommending. So I have seen them accept that. Some of the places that um, do testing are usually your psychologist or psychiatrist office. Some of the children's hospitals do it. Usually the children's hospitals have a very long wait list, so it's harder to get in and harder to get your results. Um, so just keep that in mind. And then also know that with COVID, they've relaxed some of these testing um, requirements as, as far as the as far as requ requesting those accommodations. So they've relaxed some, so you just want to check. So let's talk about the SAT, ACT, um, those types of tests. So let's think about this. Uh, some of our kids, again, they don't test well or they have test anxiety, things like that. If your child is entering any kind of certificate course not a degree program, any licensing or certificate course, they don't need the SAT or the ACT. So just spare them that headache unless you just want them to have that exercise and, um, and learn from it. Also, if they're going into the community college, they don't have to have the SAT or the ACT. So, so if their first higher education um, you know, spot is going to be the community college. They don't have to have the SAT or ACT. In Texas, there is something called the Texas Success Initiative. I'm not sure I have this on the slide, so you might want to write that down. The Texas Success Initiative. It's also known as the TSI. It's basically the college interest exam, which is not necessary for a certificate or licensing programs, but it, it, it is necessary for four credit classes um, where they're going to have a, you know, a, de a degree program. Okay. So the TSI, this is in addition for a university, you're going to usually have to have the SAT or the ACT, but the TSI is also going to be necessary. There are all kinds of practice, um, practice tests for the TSI online. Some are free, some you can pay for. It's a small nominal price that you would pay for it. I've done the free ones with my kids. I've done the paid for ones. My opinion is I like the paid for ones better. I felt they better prepared them for the TSI. So what the TSI is checking is reading, writing, and math. That's what they're checking. And you could pass math and not pass reading or pass reading and not pass writing. And it basically, if each section that you pass, that means that your child could take four credit classes in those subjects. If they don't pass the TSI, it doesn't mean that they can't go 
um, to school, it just means that it, when they go to school that you're going to be paying for non-credit classes to get them up to speed. So I just want to mention that as well. Um, SAT and ACT, there are accommodations available for those tests, and you have to go to their website specifically. Type in uh, disability, uh, disability accommodations in the search box, and it's going to take you to the page where you can download the application that will be necessary to apply for accommodations for the SAT and ACT. You can also work with the school guidance counselor on this if, if accommodations are, are necessary. The school guidance counselor can help you with this. You can do it yourself. And SAT and ACT are also going to want to see testing. Their website will tell you um, how old the testing can be. Um, they're going to want to see testing along with that application, and that application generally needs to be signed by a physician. So just check those out, prepare early, and, and set your test date for a time that you know that those accommodations are going to be in place. SAT and ACT accommodation approvals take a little bit of time. And when I say a little bit of time, I don't mean like three months, but they could take a month. So you need to plan on that, plan accordingly, and, and, and you know, make notes to follow up with them to, if you haven't heard back from them. Okay, so we talked about the 504s and the IEPs that don't transfer to higher education. A lot of the offices of disability, they will take your IEP and they will have a look at it. They have interest in knowing what accommodations were made available for your student previously, but they are not bound by that, and they, they don't have to give you the same uh, accommodations. Another thing that you want to uh, think about is um, power of attorney, healthcare power of attorney. When our kids, all kids, whether they have a disability or not, I'm a fan of having a power of attorney and a healthcare power of attorney. If your student becomes incapacitated or something happens, that you can um, interact uh, on their behalf. So we saw this a lot with COVID, where um, kids had mental health crises and things like that. There was no healthcare power of attorney in place. The child was taken to a mental health facility. They wouldn't even tell them where they went. I mean, so these are real things that are important. The other thing that you need to know, and I don't think I have this on the slide either, is the FERPA. Adrian, if you'll put this in the um, chat box, it's F-E-R-P-A, the FERPA. This is a document that needs to be signed by your student um, if you want to call the school on their behalf, if you want to talk to the bursar's office, if you want to talk to the academics office, whoever you want to talk to, that FERPA has to be on file. And a lot of families are annoyed by that because they're like, hey, wait a minute, you take my money every month, um, but you won't talk to me. <laughs> so it is frustrating, but that FERPA is important. And usually on the college or university website, you can download the FERPA. Um, and get that submitted in. Okay, so um, reasonable accommodation is required if it does not pose undue hardship. So it's just important um, to know uh, that those reasonable accommodations are required if it does not pose undue hardship. And this is also true for housing. Some of our kids have social issues. Maybe they shouldn't have a roommate. Maybe they have other equipment or things like that that might be annoying to a roommate. Um, there is a such thing for housing accommodations as well. Um, obviously, there's, you know, laws as far as handicap accessible rooms and things along those the uh, things along that line. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, I mentioned the Department of Labor earlier. I mentioned the um, registered apprenticeships out there for that. Um, there's also a job accommodation network, askjan.org, that I wanted to mention to you guys as well. Um, okay, so, yep, thank you, Adrian. She's got that FERPA in the chat box. So that's an important document. Okay, educational option list. I always start by saying we don't work for them and they don't work for us. There are a lot of programs out there. All these blue links are links to those programs. Um, some of the, these places are on the list um, because they um, have um, – a certificate program or a licensing program. Some of them are degree programs. Some of these schools that are on the list right now are on the list because they have, they are known for having really good offices of disability. And when it came to thinking about programs um, for, for my child, I think first we were looking at the degree path or the interest 
right first and narrowing the schools down that way. And then what we did is we looked at the offices of disability. We knew we needed accommodations and we knew what we needed and we were not willing to settle for anything less. So when we had our list of schools, then we researched those offices of disability and any school that had a bad office of disability, they were off the list. That's kind of how we did it. Um, and so if you know your child needs accommodations, I do recommend that as it, it is helpful. Um, okay, so these are just, again, um, what I would say on these programs Research these programs early. I always get the eye roll here, but I recommend parents making spreadsheets so that way you can keep up of what is what. I found it super, super annoying as a parent that all of these programs have different different deadlines, different requirements, different numbers of people that they take. Some are in person, some are not. And, and so it's just a lot of moving parts. So if you're really looking at, you know, 10 different places or really looking at your, your options here, I do suggest that. The other thing that I would um, mention is starting early because some of these programs, while the program is great, they don't have unlimited seats, right? So if you, um, you know, want to make sure that your child has a spot in one of these programs, programs, um, you know, the whole, you know, story of the early bird gets the worm. Uh, that's probably true for that as well. And this is not an all inclusive list of every program that is out there. I mean, there are all kinds of programs out there um, that you can research that are all across uh, the U.S., not just in Texas, but um, because we are predominantly a Texas audience today, uh, we were focusing more um, on the Texas programs. Okay, so again, we're going to run through some of these things because these are just things that once you guys get these slides that you'll be able to click the link yourself and kind of research those and see um, some of these certificate programs. I mean, it could be restaurant management, hospitality industry. Um, industry. It could be horticulture. There's all kinds of um, different ones out there. Um, and, and some of the community colleges, it's not a, a, a program. So there are programs specifically for kids who have intellectual disability, which um, we're talking about IQs of 70 or below or IQs of 75 and below with um, multiple disabilities. And some of these programs are not specifically for, for, for kids with intellectual disabilities, but again, that they they understand that the person does have a disability. So thinkcollege.net, uh, this is another place you may have heard of before. I just wanted to mention it for any families that may be moving out of Texas or might be interested in looking at um, programs that are outside of Texas, thinkcollege.net. They're going to um, you know, have the other programs um, all across the U.S., not just in Texas. So this is a good website um, to check out. Um, for, for those of you, I would say it, it's kind of like a part-time job when we were, you know, doing this for, for my own daughter, it's like all the stuff that had to happen, the deadlines and researching the offices of disability and researching the programs and when did the applications open and close and et cetera. It's a lot. Uh, it was a lot of work. Um, and of course, you know, with, with our background, I have, you know, some of the background of this, but a lot of people want to know what if I want to hire somebody else to do this and what I would say is there are a lot of college consultants out there but college consultants that are nuanced or have any background at all and working with kids with disabilities are few and far between so again um, we don't work for her she doesn't work for us but Jody Glau is somebody that we do like to refer so if you're a family um, that says, listen, I need help with this, and I just want to hire a professional to help um, help help me through this. Jody really works with you and your student. She has toured these places all across the country, and she really knows um, she really knows her stuff, and she's really really good at finding a good fit uh, for your student. And she only takes, I mean, she only takes, I want to say, like twenty. Um, clients on a year because she is really, really um, tailors her um, her work to your student. And so she doesn't spread herself too thin. But she is um, one that if you want to hire somebody and have somebody on your side um, finding the right fit for you, she she's your girl. OK, um, the college living experience. This is um, something that Basically, it's post-secondary guidance and instruction. They have academics, career development, independent living skill, skills, social development. Um, your student lives there, and they might attend the community college 
or uh, the university that is nearby there, this is an additional expense on top of the college expense. So this is kind of cost prohibitive for some families. Um, but for some families, this is exactly what they needed because maybe their student wasn't ready to live um, quite independently in the dorm. They needed a little bit of help. Um, so this has been a good fit for some families. So I always like to mention that. Campus Connections, Bloom Consulting. We don't work for them. They don't work for us. But Bloom Consulting is uh, an organization that we like. They, um, they're they known for doing vocational evaluations. You can hire them directly yourself, private pay, and have your child um, tested a vocational evaluation to see what their gaps or impediments to employment are. Um, they also work with uh, vocational rehab, so you can have that vocational evaluation that I was mentioning paid for by vocational rehab if your student is in VR. Um, but Bloom Consulting has a campus connections program. Um, this is a program that's a little bit more affordable than some of the live live. Um, you know, live in programs. But this campus connection program goes alongside your student when they're at the university or community college. It's a wraparound program. They get a coach, mentoring, guidance, and really navigational support, things like that. And it's really trying to just push your student towards independence and problem solving and not always reaching out to mom and dad for everything. And I don't know about your house, but you know, some of our kids, they get in their teenage years and they really don't want our input as much anymore. They don't find it as valuable as they once did. Um, but this is a nice, um, I don't know, it's a nice conduit to work with your student and help them, you know, uh, you know, get this, get hit the milestones that they want to hit and be successful. Okay. So this is a thousand dollars per month. It's private pay. And again, sometimes this is covered by vocational rehab. So just know about that and um, your Bloom Consulting website. They've got a lot of stuff that they've got going on. So this is a website that's probably worth checking out and you can reach out to them directly. Okay. So Training and education scholarships, workforce solution scholarships support training for some of the region's high skill, high growth occupations. If you're interested in pursuing training, workforce solutions can help you determine what you want to study, how to pay for it, where you might go for, um, for assistance. So we've talked about workforce commission, right? So the workforce commission is vocational rehab VR. And then we've got um, workforce solutions. So this is where we're going to be talking about that pre-employment training services, summer earn and learn, which is also, um, they throw that acronym around of SEAL, S-E-A-L. Um, this is a perfect time of year right now. So if you've got a student that's in high school, any, any age 14 to 22, um, and you're interested in, in pre-employment training services, summer earn and learn, um, this link right here is for the student navigators. You can email and find out who your student navigator is. You can get your child enrolled in this and they, they get jobs. They get jobs. I think they pay 10 or 11 bucks an hour. They get about, um, I don't know, 15 or 20 hours a week for, I don't know, eight to 12 weeks during the summer. So this is a pretty good program. Um, there are coaches and other things like that. So if your child needs some prompting or they need some help, there's some coaches with that as well. So we've um, also been, so we've talked about the pre-employment um, uh, training services. Um, we've got the, the Start My VR here. Um, this is the link. Um, by the way, most of the public schools and a lot of the private schools that are geared specifically to individuals with disabilities have a vocational rehab counselor um, that is tied to your school. So you can start the VR for your child yourself right on the website and kind of initiate that process. You can also check with your local guidance counselor at the high school if your child's still in school um, to, to get them signed up for that as well. Okay, so this is this is really just going to talk a little bit more about some of the transi transition services, and that's where they were um, throwing around that pre S pre employment training um, services. These services are good, guys. These are funded by state and federally funded dollars. Um, these programs they have big budgets, and they need to spend their money or they lose it. Okay, these are designed to help our kids. So. If your kid needs help, don't be too proud. Sign up for these services. There's a lot of training. So they'll do the testing. Uh, the testing is a big thing. So remember, if we're thinking about higher education 
in the future, and the last time your child got tested was five years old, you sign them up for VR, they're going to do some testing. They're going to do some of that neuropsych testing, the vocational evaluation. Some of that testing that you might need for um, accommodations would be covered by VR and paid for uh, by VR. And a lot of that testing is anywhere from $3,500 to $5,000. So if you have outdated testing and you're kind of thinking or worrying about that, that is a, a good place to go. And what I have found is that when VR is scheduling that testing, it is happening sooner versus later, as opposed to the local children's hospital telling you that they have a 12 month waiting list or something ridiculous. So just keep that in mind as well. Okay, so we've kind of talked about a lot of things, but what we haven't really talked about is funding. And the thing is, is it's expensive. When we start talking about higher education, even if it's the community college, obviously the community college is a lot cheaper than the university. I've always, you know, I've always been a fan of, you know, if a child can take uh, dual credit, like while they're in high school, get their feet wet with, with um, you know, a community college course, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm also not a fan of, a, uh, of an individual going to the community college for the first two years and knocking out their basics before going on to the university. And if, you know, finances are an issue or, you know, if we're looking at money, um, that is a cheaper way to go about doing it. Some people have trust funds. They have 529 plans. Sometimes grandma and grandpa's paying for college and things like that, and they're not worried about it. Um, but let's just talk about the financing here. So the FAFSA, F-A-F-S-A, -F -S -S Free Application for Federal Student Aid. This is available um, October 1st each year. The, the FAFSA needs to be completed all years that your student is in college. If you have multiple ch children in college, it's multiple FAFSAs. Each child has their own FAFSA, okay? A lot of um, families will say, well, we're not going to do the FAFSA because we make too much money. And that is really a bad idea. Everybody needs to do the FAFSA, okay? Even if you make too much money, a lot of the scholarships that are out there um, require a FAFSA. So if you don't, if you didn't do the FAFSA, you've automatically disqualified your child for a scholarship. So I, um, you know, I would say that I was really looking at scholarships <clears throat> for my own child and what could we get? Um, what could we do? And I was researching this early and, and that is my advice. You know, if you're, if you're late to the party, it's okay. Start now. But the sooner you research this kind of stuff and kind of have a plan, the more likely you're, you're going to get better funding or even full funding for your college experience for your child. So there are a ton of scholarships out there. This is where the spreadsheet comes in, in, into play again. Where and, and I would say that your student, whether they have a disability or don't have a disability, they need you and they need your help on this. But being aware of what scholarships are out there, when do the applications open up, when do they close, what are the requirements for these applications. If your child is going to the university, most of the college, um, the university applications require essays. I am a fan, and I'm just saying this now because we're in February, so if you're, you know, if your child is going to be a rising senior, senior um, I am a fan of the kids knocking out their essays in the summer. The senior year starts and it's fast and furious and they have sports and they have band and they have all these extracurricular activities. Trying to write their essays for these college applications is like pulling IT. Now, there'll be tears in the summer when you make them do it in the summer. But trust me, I, I promise you, you'll be glad that you did, that you had that knocked out. You had it behind. You can Google. There's usually three essay prompts. You're going to want your child to write all three essays. And once they're done, then they, they just need to be edited a little bit and sent off when the, those applications open. A lot of the scholarships require essays, and they use similar essay prompts. So having those done early is going to be important. So scholarships, think about community-based, school-based, disability, disease-based, sport, music, or band-based. So, you know, obviously there's academic-based. Um, there, I mean, there's so many different ones out there, and we've got links to so many out there. So you can look at them and see, you know, if they're if they're worth it to you. So I say again, research early, know your deadlines, have your deadlines on the on spreadsheet. And what I would tell you is, I was absolutely shocked um, the year we started this with my own child. 
because you think you start the senior year, say you start the senior year in August or September. Um, and so you think that school is going to start and that you are going to work on your college applications and your scholarship applications over Christmas break. A lot of families think that. Um, and while some of those, some will work out, there are a lot of deadlines that are by December 1st for these scholarships. A lot of them are by December 15th. There is a few that are going to be in the spring, you know, later in the spring, but a lot of them, the big scholarships, the good ones that you want, um, the deadlines are December 1st. So if you're waiting for Christmas break, you miss the boat and you're automatically not going to get that. Okay. So we know that college plans, 529 college savings plan can pay for college. And um, that's a 529C. A 529A for ABLE can also pay for college. Um, an ABLE account is, is specifically for an individual with a disability. It's achieving a better life for an individual with a disability. And while they can pay for a variety of expenses, which we'll go over in a minute for your disabled child, it can also pay for transition programs. Um, higher education, all kinds of things. Um, and again, one thing that I want to mention, and I mentioned it a little bit already, the vocational rehab may provide support if it's in line with the goals established within the plan for the individual to find competitive employment. The whole point of vocational rehab is to close the, close the gaps that your student has that would be an impediment to employment. So, if higher education or a certificate or a degree program or other types of training might be necessary to close those gaps, vocational be rehab may foot the bill on that or defray some of the costs. So we just want you to know that as well. Okay, so we mentioned the ABLE account and um, I also wanna mention that we have entire presentations on a lot of the topics that we talk about because we only have so much time um, today. But an ABLE account, um, basically, it's, it's for an individual who has a disability. Their disability began prior to age 26. The beneficiary is the account owner. Um, it, it's not the income earned in the account is not taxable. Um, contributions um, are not deductible. Um, however, it does not jeopardize SSI and Medicaid. So for our loved ones, who qualify for SSI and Medicaid, we know we got to keep things, they, we got to keep their money under $2,000, right? They can't have more than $2,000 in their name unless it's in an ABLE account or a special needs trust. So the deal with the ABLE account, it's tax-free and um, penalty-free distributions as long as the distribution can be construed as achieving a better life for an individual with a disability. So I'm a fan of these. We're, um, we are happy to help people set those up. The ABLE National Resource Center, this little picture here is a link to their website. Um, and it's gonna talk a lot more about the ABLE programs out there. Some people ask if they, um, if they can have an ABLE account in, from any state and you absolutely can, okay? We're, we are fans of, um, of certain ones. Some are less, um, I, I would say a little bit restrictive of getting the money out. And so we're not fans of those and we're happy to, you know, go further with that. Uh Oh, I think, I think bear with me. I think I um, hit the link. I just got to go back and grab my slides. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so this is the deal with the ABLE account. Um, you can contribute whatever the annual gift tax um, exclusion is this year for 2023. It's $17,000. So you can put $17,000 a year into an ABLE account for your special needs loved one. Anybody can contribute to that. It could be a grandparent. It could be a parent. It could be the child themselves. Um, if the child is working, they can have an additional $13,590 put into the account. And I'm just going to mention here, because a lot of people want to know, if my child is working and getting SSI, could I have their paycheck just direct deposited into the ABLE account and it won't be counted for SSI? The answer is no, you cannot do that. But their paycheck could go into their account and that money could move directly from their account to the ABLE account. And so if they have, they're at risk of having excess funds of $2,000, you can definitely do that. But there's no such thing as earnings going straight into an ABLE account. There is also 
no such thing as leaving an inheritance to an ABLE account. Okay, You can leave uh, an inheritance to a special needs trust for your loved one with a disability, but you cannot leave it directly to an ABLE account. So, um, so basically what you need to know is if it can be construed as achieving a better life for an individual with a disability, you can pay for it out of an ABLE account. What I love about this is some families have a 529C for their child for college, and they're not sure if their child's going to go to college or not. And they don't want to be taxed and penalized to take that money out of the 529 and not use it for higher education. 529Cs can be converted to 529As. So if your student with a disability isn't going to go to college or maybe they went to college and they had a scholarship, you didn't need all the money that was in the 529C, you can get it converted to a 529A and you can have a lot more flexibility on what you can use that money for um, outside of higher education. Okay, so we're going to run through this. relatively quickly because these are really just links um, that I want, you know, there's a lot of links in here for various scholarships that we know about. So first things first, when it comes to scholarships, should you hire somebody or pay somebody to do scholarships for you? My answer is no. There's a lot of shams out there, um, kind of sketchy stuff, and it looks good online, but it's not good. So um, you can do this yourself, and we've got a lot of links to various scholarships out there. But think about There's scholarships for everything. So what is the disease specific? What is the diagnosis specific? There are scholarships for siblings with kids with disabilities, right? Um, So be creative, plan early. And and I had to plan for what was good for me, okay? Because we only have so many hours in the day, right? And so I applied for big scholarships that were going to make a big difference to us. Like some of the scholarships, and so I just wanted to mention this to you because for whatever it's worth, Some of the scholarships are small. It's $250. It's $500. I mean, that pays for one book. Um, And some of those applications for $500 are as ridiculously long as the ones that are going to pay $25,000. So for me, I had to choose wisely. I had to choose the ones that were going to make the biggest difference for, for my student. You should ask your child life specialist at any clinic you go to. If you go to cardiology, if you go to neurology, oncology, I don't care who you go to, whatever special it is, um, like the children's hospital, there's a child's life specialist and they usually have a good list of scholarship um, um, scholarships that are probably not on this list. They might be for specific donors that want to um, specifically donate to a, a, a child that has Down syndrome or specifically a child that has cardiac issues or things like that. So definitely ask for that. And I always like to mention here, and I'm not saying that there's you know anybody on here that this applies to, but if you happen to adopt a child through the state, um, There is a a state college tuition waiver for children that were adopted through the DFPS system or have been part of the foster care system in the past. Um, And if you're coming from another state and that was you, you should check that state as well. But your kids can go to school basically for free if that's you. Okay. Sometimes people know this. Sometimes it was a lot of years ago and people forgot that. So we just like to mention this. Um, the Terry Foundation scholarship, Terry Foundation is near and dear to my heart. My um, One of my kids was a recipient of the Terry Foundation scholarship, which is basically a full ride for four years. Okay. Um, and so this came down to researching early. So look, I'm going to just be honest with you. I was researching early and I thought, okay, uh, we have average test scores. We have decent grades, but I mean, we're not 4.0. Decent grades, average test scores. We don't participate in music, um, arts, sports, or anything. So the list was dwindling very quickly of what scholarships we might qualify for. So what I realized is there are a lot of scholarships out there for students that give back. Our students have a story. They've been through it. They've had a lot of challenges. Have they rose above those challenges? Are they giving back in their community? Do they have leadership um, potential? Um, These are all reasons that the Terry Foundation, um, they might be selected for a Terry Foundation scholarship. So what I did is I got my student volunteering. By the time she graduated high school, she had over 900 service hours with three or four really solid organizations. And what that meant for her 
was we had glowing, glowing recommendations. I can't even have written it better myself as a parent. Um, glowing recommendation letters from executive directors of organizations that she volunteered with. And that was directly the reason why she ended up with this scholarship. Okay. So this scholarship is awesome. It's, it's in Texas. It's the largest um, scholarship um, fund out there and it runs in perpetuity. Um, it is largely funded. It's a big, big deal. And it's only for Texans. Okay. So get your kids volunteering. They don't fall in the category of all of these other, you know, accolades that I was mentioning. What can they do? Think about what they can do. Okay. So um, the cool thing about the Terry Foundation Scholarship, it, they have the scholarship at all of these schools. So you can literally apply for the scholarship at all of these schools and get it at one of them. Okay. Um, so you could increase your um, options of, of, you know, you, you, I, what's the word I'm looking for? It really just increase your odds of, of gaining one of those scholarships. Okay, so here are some additional links. Um, and, and just again, it's not an all inclusive list of scholarships that are out there, but these are, you know, diagnosis or disease specific scholarships th that are out there. Think of any diagnosis that your student has. Um, anything that they're, they're struggling with, there may be additional scholarships out there. So check these out. Get your spreadsheet, figure out which ones that you're wanting to apply for. And the thing is, is a lot of families are busy and they don't want to do this. And the kids need the help with this. The kids do not need help on you writing their essays because the, the um, admissions people know that. So don't write your kids essays. But they do need help on some of these scholarship applications. They're not easy. This is their first time trying their hand at this. So look at these, look at when those deadlines, um, when the application opens, what is required um, for the application, what will it pay, what is the grade point average to maintain that. Um, that was one thing that I loved about the Terry Foundation scholarship that even, you know, some of these scholarships, I call it, they give and they take away. So you, you get the scholarship, but then you have to have an A average or something like that to maintain it or some read. Re unrealistic, um, you know, grade to, to maintain it all four years. And the, the Terry Foundation was like B or C, you could even get C's and still maintain that um, scholarship. So that matters as well. So I'm just going to run through these. I mean, again, think whatever it is, is it autism? Is it Down syndrome? Is it cerebral palsy? You know, muscular dystrophy? It could be anything. Um, there are scholarships out there for it. So we've just got a lot of links here. And this is why we're sending out the slides today to everybody. So that way you can kind of explore some of these links yourself um, and see if any of these might be a fit for you. Now, we recognize that a lot, some families may not want to do this again. They might be fully funded. Grandparents might be paying for college or whatever, but for families that are on a tight budget or are really struggling or thinking about how they're going to pay for college, do this. What I will tell you is I worked very, very, very hard on this for my own child, and um, I, I think we ended up with 10 scholarships. We, we gave back I think we gave back six of them because we were fully funded. Some of the other ones paid for some other things. Um, but it, I, what I would say is it was totally worth my time. You get scholarships for your kids and you don't have to shell out a hundred or a hundred and a half. Uh, that's $150,000 more, a hundred thousand dollars more to your own retirement in your future. Maybe you can retire earlier. Um, so, so to me, I think it matters. Um, these are a couple of books that we like to um, mention. The Fist Guide to Colleges 2023 is out. You can get that on Amazon. This is an older book here, Colleges That Change Lives. Guys, there are a lot of schools out there that are small, um, and they're really family-like. Um, so for our kids that might not be a good fit um, <clears throat> for a university class that has 200 kids in it, um, you know, in one class, this college colleges that change lives. This is a good book to um, to to look at. Um, you can get that on Amazon. You probably get that at the library as well. So always like to mention that. So um, we've mentioned that you know a lot of things uh, today. We do have upcoming webinars. I mentioned my YouTube channel um, at the beginning. It's the Consolidated Planning Group YouTube channel. We have a lot of edu educational webinars. You name it special needs trust, guardianship, SSI, Medicaid, um, Social Security Disability, Medicare, 
higher education. We, we have so many out there. So we invite you um, to look at our upcoming webinars. This will take you to the link and there'll be signups if you want to sign up for any additional webinars that are coming up. Um, and then our YouTube channel will have all of the past ones out there. These are just some things that um, we recommend that you keep on your special needs planning radar. We do have webinars on every single one of these topics. Um, waivers and interest lists, that's a big one um, that comes up um, quite a bit. Um, and really just, you know, how do, we, how do we develop a comprehensive special needs care plan for our loved one? When we're thinking about transition, transition, that word, it, it means so many things to so many people. Sometimes it's just transitioning medical care. And if you've done that or if you're, on, if you're about to do that, it's not a small job. We've been in that cocoon of pediatrics for so many years, and we've had great doctors and great relationships, and everything starts changing when they're between 18 and 21. So all of this transition stuff is a big deal, and we're thinking about next steps. And I think the biggest advice that I can give is just plan early, um, be intentional, and again, they are where they are. They're not behind. And, you know, taking that step, maybe your child graduates the community college when they're 30 years old. Who cares? Maybe they get that certificate or that license program. There are plenty of people that do not have degrees that got a certificate or a license, and they're making as much or more than um, their counterparts that did get degrees. So just think about those things as well. I always like to say um, we want you to meet our team. Uh, we have an awesome team here at Consolidated Planning Group. It's not just me. Michelle will do a lot of our webinars as well. Um, we are nationally certified as Social Security Advisors, members of the Special Needs Planning Academy, and we are well equipped um, to help you on your planning journey. Um, I hope this uh, information has been helpful. Um, I, we have just a few minutes left. If anybody has any questions, please put your questions in the chat box. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. If you have personal questions that you don't want to put in the chat box, um, you can reach out to us directly. Um, this link right here, um, you can put your camera over that and that'll take you to our calendar. If you want to schedule a free personalized consultation, you can do it that way as well. Our team will reach out to you, see if you have any additional questions. Um, it's always our pleasure to work with you. And guys, this is hard. Um, this, journey, this journey is hard and we are, we are really here to um, help and uh, equip you and give you the tools and resources that you need to be successful. Don't be discouraged. There are a lot of there are a lot of really cool things out there for our kids, and um, I think just being a student, taking it all in, and um, and you know learning about things, I think that's half the battle right there. Um, Adrian, that's all I have for today. Um, does anybody have any additional questions? Please just put those in the chat chat box for us. Okay. I think that's all we have. Happy Saturday, everyone. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend and I look forward to chatting with you guys again soon. Take care. Bye. Bye now.